It's so great to be here. Um, uh, so happy to see so many uh, names I recognize uh, in walking around the gather hall. Um, just the FYI, I'm the way I've got my presentation going, I won't be able to see chat messages or anything while I'm talking. Uh, so um, hold your questions to the end. We may not have time for questions, but I'm going to hang around uh, in Gather and on the Discord afterwards. So feel free to hit me up either of those places. Um, awesome. Uh, so yeah, let's let's dive into this. So um, uh, so yeah, I'm Aaron Reed. Um, I'm a writer, indie game designer, occasional game historian. Um, and just really interested in general in the intersection of writing and play and how people and systems can collaborate to tell stories together. Um, here's some projects over the years that you might know me from. I kind of, my background is I came up out of the fan community of people making text adventures or parser interactive fiction. And at some point I took a, kind of a hard left turn into more experimental kinds of story games. Uh, got a graduate degree in interactive narrative, did some work in tabletop role playing games for a while, worked for a character AI startup and have generally kept pretty busy. When you might know me from more recently is a project I'm working on called 50 Years of Text Games. The Neuroscope Committee kindly summarized my rambly talk summary into two lines. Last year, I blogged through a half a century of games and text, one per year, from Oregon Trail to AI Dungeon and beyond. What have we learned? What trail are we on? And I really liked this phrasing of what trail are we on? Because I had hoped looking at the history of interactive fiction would produce some insights that, you know, Neuroscope attendees might find interesting. Like, um, you know, where this interactive narrative stuff might be going in the years ahead. And can we like get any better at it? But you can't predict the future, of course, especially when that future involves technology or art or new media forms or pandemics or, you know, much of anything, really. It's why I didn't call this talk the future of narrative games, because, well, I have thought a lot about that. If you read predictions from past decades about the future of narrative games, they are pretty universally comically wrong. If Neuroscope had been around in 1982, for instance, and I was giving a talk on the future of narrative games, I would probably have waxed rhapsodic about how great adventures in dungeons were and how over the last 10 years, dungeon games have made incredible leaps and bounds. Why, Zork had just one troll, but I predict by 1992, we might have games with 30 to 50 trolls. Dungeons will continue expanding in scope until the possibilities for exploring them become nearly limitless. Or at Neuroscope 1992, I might have talked about how the future of narrative games is obviously full motion video. We'll go from games with an hour or two of footage on one CD-ROM to hundreds of hours of video on veritable stacks of CD-ROMs. And so on and so forth. I'm uh, not going to belabor this joke any more than is strictly necessary. But when it came to thinking about what lessons I've learned from this history project we might apply to the future, I think it's maybe a lot safer and wiser of a bet to stay focused on the past. And in a weird way, this might actually be a much more useful way to get our heads around what the future of this field might hold. We have a crystal clear view now over half a century of what's worked and what hasn't. All the twists and turns of the trail we've taken to get here laid out in exquisite detail behind us. If we imagine ourselves hiked up a mountain to look back there, even if our back is to the next 50 years ahead, we can still maybe get a sense of what that territory might hold by looking at the land behind. So this is going to be my talk. I'm going to introduce the 50 Years of Text Games project for those who aren't familiar with it. And then I'm going to share five interesting takeaways from this multi-year project of looking at interactive fiction's history, each one paired with one of the games I researched for the project. And these are lessons in aggregate for many games from the past and might therefore be likely to keep applying to the games we make in the future. I should say, too, that these lessons are about text games specifically, because that's my kind of area of focus. But they're also kind of general, and I think they can apply to the broader world of narrative games, too. So what is 50 Years of Text Games? It's a project that started as a blog series and has now become a full-length book. It takes one text game each year, starting in 1971, when a game for teletypes called The Organ Trail debuted in a Minnesota middle school classroom. And it does an in-depth, deep-dive analysis into how it worked, why it was made, and what part it was playing in the evolution of interactive storytelling. Now, this involved a lot of research and a lot of writing. Uh, by the time the book comes out, it will have all told been a project three years in the making. I just did a crowdfunding campaign for the book that, somewhat to my astonishment, raised over half a million dollars and became the second or third most successful nonfiction book project in Kickstarter history, just in case anyone is wondering if there's any interest or passion out there for what we're all here at this conference to discuss. When I first started the project, I thought I'd mostly be covering text adventures and parser interactive fiction because that was the community I came out of and was most familiar with. 
But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that text games really could cover a huge swath of genres. What about multiplayer text games or lost genres like BBS games? What about hypertext fiction or hacking simulators? What about game books or spoken word audio games? And as I pulled back my scope more and more, what emerged was this huge body of work that's rarely all been in conversation together, but all shares this commonality of telling an interactive story using mostly words, not graphics or multimedia. And my working definition of a text game basically became games you want to share excerpts from, not screenshots. The broader games industry, of course, is primarily visual, trafficking in colorful screen grabs and trailers full of motion. But a screenshot of a text game is kind of missing the point. It's the words that matter, regardless of how they're styled or what color the background is. I had a couple other caveats in my definition. I was mostly focusing on games that use text as words, not as surrogate graphics like some roguelikes, and in projects that were creating a fictional world you could explore rather than more abstract things like text art or word games. But this phrase, excerpts not screenshots, captured the essence of the games I wanted to write about. So here's the final list of games I ended up covering. And it's really important to note that this isn't and cannot be the 50 best games or the 50 most canonical games or even my favorite 50 games. This idea of covering one and only one game from each year made that impossible, if for no other reason than there were many, many times when two or more indisputably classic text games came out the same year. Instead, I was kind of looking for a mixture of games, popular and obscure, noteworthy for a range of reasons, by a broad selection of different kinds of people, speaking to different definitions of what text games could do and be. It's a sampler pack, if you will, not a full menu. And this list makes for a fascinating cross-section of an art form developing alongside the history of computation and how those intertwined artistic and technical developments have been in conversation with the long history of literature and the written word. Each game covered in the book is a unique snapshot of the time and place it was made, a negotiation and compromise with incompatible artistic and cultural and economic and technical concerns. From atop this mountain we've climbed, we can see the terrain behind us is far more varied and fascinating than we might appreciate from ground level. It's a country, and so much of it remains undiscovered. So let's get into it. My first takeaway from doing this project is that community is everything. Looking back from that hilltop, you see some lone fires, but mostly clusters and chains of inspiration. I want to kind of puncture the misconception that this is a solitary field. Again and again, the games that changed things grew from communities working together. And my example to illustrate this point is one of the first games in the book, way back near the beginning of the map of this country, Hunt the Wumpus. Like a lot of the games in this project, you might have heard of it, but it has an interesting history that not everyone knows. And to understand that, we need to rewind to the early 70s when personal computers were still a dream. And when you heard the word computer, you probably thought of something scary. The military, the government, a big soulless corporation. Computers were for the elites, and only the elites could hope to understand or operate them with languages like Fortran still dominant that could be baffling to outsiders. But times were changing. Computers were getting smaller and cheaper, and clearer languages like BASIC were gaining popularity, in part because it was conceivable that you could teach them to regular people. And getting regular people access to computers became a kind of rallying call for some folks, especially in the counterculture movement. One of the projects that came out of this notion was a place called the People's Computer Center in what would soon become Silicon Valley in California. The PCC was a retail storefront with a PDP mini computer inside. And the idea was that anyone off the street could come in and learn how to use it. There would be coding classes with a sliding scale fee, and anyone could come in to hang out, swap tips, or even play the games people were starting to write for the machine. The PCC also had a newsletter which shared source code submitted by members and became a more national space for spreading this mission of computers for everyone. And what you started seeing at the center and in the pages of the newsletter for maybe the first time was a computer game design conversation. I should mention I'm indebted for a lot of the next part of the story to work by Jason Dyer on his blog Ranga in Blue, and he's giving a talk later today on his own project about early games history, which I hope you'll check out too if you can. So in its first year, the PCC newsletter wrote up a hide and seek program written by a high school computer class. And in this game, the player attempts to guess where four computer controlled opponents are hiding on a 10 by 10 grid. After each guess, the program would tell you the distance to each opponent, and students were encouraged to use tools like graph paper and triangulation to win the game. So like a lot of early programs, this was mildly amusing for its novelty, if nothing else. But some PCC folks, unshackled from the need to make something with educational value, excuse me, 
began to create their own amusing variations on this program. A common improvement was to replace the anonymous four hiders with a single named monster. So you saw games like Mugwump that were sort of iterating on the ideas in the hide and seek game. Mugwump, for example, simplifies things down to a single monster, which makes the experience a bit more focused. Another game printed in the PCC newsletter called Herkel replaces the numeric coordinates with compass directions like Southwest, but keeps things on that same 10 by 10 grid. At the same time, another PCC member, Dave Kaufman, was working on a series of games called Caves. And in these games, you're not just guessing grid coordinates like in Battleship, you're actually occupying a specific point on a map and moving between rooms. And it starts adding the glimmers of a story. The opening text says, imagine yourself an explorer of the famous Dusseldorf Caves. You've been underground for days, tripping through the caverns and tunnels. Unfortunately, you're lost and your food has run out. The caves rooms were still just numbers, but this is starting to evolve into something that feels more immediate and is maybe a little more engaging. So one of the people who discovered the PCC around this time was a young man called Greg. This is the output of a simple program he wrote to generate an ASCII art landscape, which was printed in the PCC newsletter. So Greg had escaped an abusive childhood that had left him emotionally withdrawn, but he'd found an outlet through math and computers to express what his partner in later years called a boundless creativity and sense of playfulness. And with his math background, when Greg saw the monster hunting games being swapped around on the PCC's mini computer, he thought, well, this 10 by 10 grid is pretty boring, isn't it? The computer could easily map a much more complicated structure. And he decided he was going to build a hunt a monster game, uh, hunt a monster in a cave game, where the rooms were the vertices of a dodecahedron. That makes for 20 rooms, each with three connections to others. But if you try to map that out on a 2D piece of paper, it'll be pretty confusing and disorienting unless you're used to thinking in platonic solids. There's no way to draw a map on a flat sheet of paper without overlapping lines, and most ad hoc maps are going to look way more disorganized and messy than this one. Greg also named his game after the monster, which he called the Wumpus, and he added a couple other twists and innovations. He randomly scattered some hazards around the map. You could step into bottomless pits that would kill you, or get grabbed by super bats that would teleport you to another room. You could only detect these hazards indirectly when you were one room away, but couldn't know which adjacent room contained them unless you'd been making a map and taking careful notes. He also added some life to the monster. He might kill you if you stumble into him, or just slink away to a different room. To defeat him, you have to shoot him from a distance with a crooked arrow by defining the path through rooms to reach him and hope your guess was right about where he was. And this evolution of that hide and seek game, which had started off only a year earlier as a simplistic geometry exercise, had now become something that was actually fun and compelling to play. Each game was a little different because of the random hazards. There were different strategies you could try. The villain had just enough of a spark of life to seem intriguing. And Hunt the Wumpus spread far beyond the PCC to become one of the most influential early computer games of its era, something nearly everyone with computer access played. A few years later, one of those people was a hacker named Will Crowther, who would make a game called Adventure, in which you're still lost in a complex cave of interconnected rooms with monsters and hazards, but now the numbered rooms are richly detailed and evocative text. And this was so compelling, it would spawn the entire computer game industry shortly thereafter. So some people have asked, who invented the adventure game? Where along this chain can you identify the first? It's kind of open to interpretation, but I think a more honest answer is that adventure games emerged from this whole chain of conversations out of this early community of computer game players and designers, each trying to improve on what had come before. So community is everything. And when you look back at the history of these games, you see variants of this story again and again in communities that form around tools or around publications or companies or events. Each of these communities can be an incubator, a place that accelerates the speed of conversation and evolution, where like-minded people can inspire each other and build on each other's ideas. Quite a few games I write about in the book are explicitly collaborations, but nearly all of them are implicitly, folks using tools built by someone else in their community, or responding to someone else's prompt, or in dialogue with the game. That's great, amazing, but what if it tried this instead? And I think in one sense, this is kind of obvious and applies to a lot of other creative media as well. But I think we can fool ourselves into thinking it doesn't apply to IF quite as much, because after all, isn't the strength of text games that a single person can make them, that they don't need a whole team of artists and coders and designers? Aren't we really a field where a lone genius can make a masterpiece? Well, kind of. And there certainly are incredible creators in our field. But if you look behind the scenes, so many of these games were created in the context of a strong community. Just one example 
Emily Short Scalatia, which if you don't know it, is a super influential work from 2000 that's an entire game about a single conversation, was created explicitly in response to an event called the IF Art Show that prompted writers to make pieces focusing on a single aspect of interactive fiction, like setting or character. And it was written in Inform, a tool that had been the product of years of work itself inspired by other community projects, and which, through the work of many hands, had been built up into a stable platform and ecosystem for telling interactive stories. And there's a story like that behind all of these games, which isn't to minimize the achievement of their creation, but in every case, they're part of a larger conversation. There's a flip side to this lesson, though. If community is everything, where are you when you're outside the community? And I think this lesson becomes less of a general platitude when we use it to think about the specific ways our communities have failed and how we can do better. Just a few quick examples. Interactive fiction throughout most of its first 50 years of history has been embarrassingly white and privileged. It's worth noting that this People's Computer Center cartoon from 1972 deliberately includes working people, old people, people of color, and it's taken far too long to start realizing this dream of computers and coding as a truly accessible creative tool for everyone. So how can we keep working to make our communities look more like this picture? I think one actionable thing we can all do is take a close look at how other communities are making practical outreach more of a priority. And I wanna highlight one of my local tabletop role-playing conventions in the Bay Area, Big Bad Con, which over the last few years has really put their money where their mouth is about making tabletop gaming more welcoming to more people through scholarships, programs for attending their event, uh, micro grants to support marginalized creators, making it a priority to bring in speakers and game makers from underrepresented communities, and a whole lot more. So think about what your communities can do now, this year, to make the future of interactive fiction more inclusive. Another flavor of this ties back to that lone genius myth I mentioned. As I researched this book, it shocked me, though it shouldn't have, how often behind a famous game generally attributed to a man, there was a wife or a girlfriend or a partner who never did interviews or claimed credit, but was instrumental to the game's success. And I want to be clear, this is not meant to call out any of these individual authors, because there were often institutional concerns or privacy reasons or other rationales behind these individual cases. Infocom's Mike Berlin, for instance, collaborated with his wife Muffy on games before and after his time there, but Infocom's policies prevented her from being involved on his projects at the company. You can't, of course, turn off your creative brain when you leave the office, though, and Mike has later said many times that Muffy was a collaborator on every one of his games. So it's less the individual examples than the overall pattern, right? Sometimes these partners were doing creative work, sometimes support work of various kinds, from producing to handling business details to building back-end infrastructure or front-end UI. And of course, there are countless more examples of this kind of invisible support that didn't even merit a credit or a footnote. There's, of course, a large cultural problem here about what kinds of work and people get valued. But there's also some blinders specific to our community about what parts of a game collaboration are important, are worth crediting and celebrating. So two takeaways, I think. Guys, let's reverse this trend in the next 50 years. How can you provide the pillars of support and inspiration and community for your partner's projects, even if you're not going to get the one who's going to get a credit on the box? And how can all of us better value and support our unsung collaborators doing tools work, infrastructure work, support work, the communities, small and large, that make our games happen? All right, second takeaway, stable platforms matter. There's a page in the 50 years book where I index the games I cover by their tool of creation. And it's striking that some of the biggest clusters aren't around domain-specific languages for making interactive fiction, but ubiquitous coding environments that were commonly available and easy to use. In the 70s and 80s, BASIC enabled tons of people from experts to novices to easily make games like Hunt the Wumpus, and its influence on early computer history can really not be overstated. More recently, JavaScript has been similarly democratizing, although I think we're sadly seeing that fade now as it becomes increasingly encrusted with libraries and frameworks. And I'll have uh, more of a rant on that later. Uh, but domain-specific languages just for making text games are on there too. But I think overall this illustrates that having a platform that's stable enough that a community can gather around it, even if it's not the perfect platform for that community on a technical level, is really crucial. And that can be hard to enable, but I think it's worth trying. And there are some good success stories. So I want to talk about a modern example of a stable platform, and that's ChoiceScript, made by Choice of Games. It's been around since 2009 or so and hasn't changed too much in that time. ChoiceScript is deliberately very simple, and the advantage of this simplicity is it opens up authorship of their games to a broader range of people. Werewood, which is one of well over 100 text games they've commercially released at this point, 
was not made by a full-time game designer or even someone for whom making games was their most important hobby. Its author, Isabella Shaw, is an opera singer. The week her game was released, she was performing the lead role of Lucretia on stage, which is not something that most game devs are doing on release week. Her game is a fantasy story set in a world where social power and magical power are linked together. The humans living at the edge of the wood long ago made a dangerous contract with fell creatures who live there. Isn't that always the way? And as a consequence, those who don't maintain their social status, who fall into disgrace, can have their very souls stolen away from them. It's a bit of a parable where the dangers of being seen as outside the norm are given a sharp, fantastical edge. Choice of Games asks their authors to write directly in choice script, unlike some companies that maybe have a coder or engineer translate a writer's copy from a Word doc into an interactive form. And that means the language needs to be simple enough that regular writers can quickly learn to use it. Here's a tiny chunk of code from their first game, Choice of the Dragon. There's a minimum of syntax with indentation to keep track of nested choices and a way to modify stats up or down and use them to affect what text is printed or choices are offered later on. There's more to the language than this, of course, but the whole thing is pretty straightforward. And the creators have actively resisted adding too many new features that might get in the way of this simple syntax, which is pretty impressive for a 13-year-old language. Even though the tool is simple, it doesn't mean choice script games can't get complex. Some have run over a million words long with elaborate storylines altering based on dozens of variables or running to pages and pages of code to conditionally assemble a single paragraph of heavily customized text. Um, that last one might have been me, full disclosure. That was me. I did that. Um, Choice of Games titles also go through a heavy editorial process that starts before the first word is written. And in lieu of a good visual for this slide, I just want to plug a Neuroscope talk by my wonderful editor when I wrote a book for Choice of Games, Rebecca Slit, which I believe is happening in the very next time slot after this. So even before the first word, the company has the writers go through a detailed process of outlining their story with feedback, workshopping the major choice points you're planning in each chapter and whether they'll feel satisfying to players while remaining in scope to author. And this support system continues all through the writing, revision, testing, and debugging of your game. And that's also a vital part of creating a stable platform that newcomers and old hands alike can stand on, a reliable stage so performers don't have to worry about building their own. So stable platforms matter. ChoiceScript isn't doing anything too technically exciting, but I think, and apologies to Dan Fabulich and everyone else behind ChoiceScript, you can think of it a little like a boring, unsexy table, or let's say a workbench. It's not the most glamorous job to build a workbench, but it's a necessary one. It's providing that stable platform for people like Isabella Shaw and others to build interactive stories on. So practically, how do you make a good workbench? Well, it should be steady in time and in space, not changing too much and around for as long as possible. And that's not just a technical problem, it's a financial one if you're running a business. Choice of Games has stayed afloat since 2009 and that's taken a lot of work and planning, I'm sure. If they'd burned hot in their first few years, tried to be too ambitious and gone bankrupt, that workbench wouldn't have had time to attract a community of makers. A workbench ought to stand alone. If you need to drag half a dozen other credenzas, stools, hutches, and end tables over to effectively use it, it's a lot less useful of a table. The beauty of basic and early JavaScript was that they just ran. You didn't need extra downloads, libraries, modules, transpilers, dependencies, package managers, IDEs, or build tools to use them all of them failure points that might break your bench either now or some random day in the future. Similarly, I think platforms like Inform benefit so much from just being standalone applications that you can just download and get to work in. You generally don't have to worry that those applications are gonna break if you install or upgrade something else. But that convenience again doesn't just happen. It's the result of hardworking people behind the scenes maintaining that tool, a community, there's that word again, focusing on the backstage mechanism so that creators can shine in the spotlight. A workbench should be well used. The more people building things on top of it, the more chances you have to refine it, to get out of their way and let them work. If you want to build a new workbench, I think an even bigger question than your technical challenges and design goals is how you're going to find people to work at your bench, what you're offering them that other benches don't have, and whether you're willing to put their needs above your own. And lastly, I think it's important that a workbench be straightforward. If you've got advanced features, they shouldn't get in the way of using the simple ones. So a stable platform isn't necessarily the next big thing. It doesn't have to be radically moving the state of the art forward. It's doing something different. It's giving folks a way to skill up and innovate within the space of that platform. And those edges are limiting in some ways, but you can build a lot of sandcastles even in a tiny sandbox. Again, this isn't to say you can't go off and build your own workbench. 
But successful examples of that are rarer than you might think. More common is taking someone else's workbench and improving it just a little bit to expand or shift the kind of stuff that can be made on it. And an interesting example of that, <clears throat> as we transition to our next point, is the evolutionary path of MUDs, multi-user dungeons. So we saw how adventure built on games like Hunt the Wumpus that came before it. I want to draw a little graph of inspirations to the next game I want to talk about. And I'm going to rush through this a bit because the flow of the river here is more important than understanding each bend and twist. <clears throat> OK. <clears throat> so. Will Crother makes adventure, uh, but abandons it unfinished. A year later, Don Woods comes along, finishes it, adds a bunch of game-like features, because kind of goes viral on the ARPANET. It inspires a different group of people to do a kind of remake called Zork. Eventually, they found a company to sell a home computer version of it, um, which kind of spawns the whole commercial text adventure industry. Uh, but for a while, mainframe Zork was called Dungeon, and that version got spun off and cloned. And in 1978, a group of students in the UK made a multi-user version of Dungeon called MUD. Instead of, uh, or the idea was, you know, multiple people in the same fictional world, and this proved incredibly alluring. Eventually, mature MUD platforms like Abermud appeared, which led to hundreds and eventually thousands of MUDs. Most of them were hack and slash combat affairs, like the original, but this, but this weird one called Monster focused more on world building by giving, giving every user the sort of admin powers to create new rooms and objects in the world. So a guy named James Aspinas uh, stripped out all the combat and monsters from Abermud. Um, took some of the monster ideas and released Tiny Mud, a more stable and reusable version of uh, uh, that idea about a game more about creation than destruction. And then that led to a chain of imitation engines iterating and improving. Maybe the D didn't have to stand for dungeon. Maybe you could have multi-user shared hallucinations or construction kits. But these systems were limited because the ability to create new rooms and objects only gets you so far. What you really need to help reshape the world is the ability to actually reprogram it while you're inside it. So a package called MUD Object Oriented, or MOO, was released. And in 1991, a researcher at the Xerox Park think tank who went by the online alias of Lambda, Pavel Curtis, made his own clone of MOO called Lambda MOO, which is the next game we're going to talk about. Phew, OK. <clears throat> so I love this chain of inspiration because it shows how closely linked so much of this history is. Lambda MOO is very different than adventure, but there's this direct line of inspiration that leads to it, which is really cool to see. I'm going to pause to take a drink. <laughs> that slide was a mouthful. <clears throat> OK. So Lambda Moo will look familiar if you've ever played a text adventure. You're moving around a virtual world simulated in text and can take actions in it, except that it's a persistent world that hundreds of other people can also be inside. And as with the original Moo, the key concept is that everything in the world, from people to rooms to items to exits, is an object that can be created, altered, or scripted. Generally, only the creator of an object has permissions to alter it, but you could use that object inheritance to create a child of that object and alter its properties. So Pavel Curtis might have made an object called room with code inside it for directional movement, room descriptions, and so on. Someone else could come in and make a child called outdoor room that inherits all of room's properties, but maybe adds new behaviors like specifying that the sun and sky are always visible. And then someone else could create a child of outdoor room called East Meadow to create one such room in particular. So Curtis sort of seeded this world by making a bunch of rooms forming a map of his own house. And I should say that this is only a tiny, tiny portion of what Lambda Moo's map grew into. As uh, Curtis invited the first wave of friends and colleagues in, he asked them to create whatever they wanted with these commands, dig for new rooms and create for new objects, but to keep the world thematically consistent. So you could add new rooms to the house, maybe add to the grounds around it, discover it had a secret attic or basement, even shift into parallel dimensions but keep Lambda House the core of the world, keep suspension of disbelief in that fictional reality. And as more and more people joined the house, it started taking on these dizzyingly fractal qualities. The grounds outside extended past lawns and gardens through thickets and rolling hills, eventually stretching to distant beaches and lands beyond. Pocket dimensions sprung up within the house itself, like the Looking Glass Tavern, which could be visited by gazing into a mirror in the foyer, or an entire hotel built into a piece of a working Monopoly set in the dining room. Tree houses, rooftop observatories, hidden underground grottos, crawl spaces between the walls, the house and its grounds had become a wonderland of creative architecture and inspired world building. But the beauty of the Moo programming language was that players could do more than make descriptions of these environments. They could actually make them function. One example was the description of the living room, which was kind of the central hub and gathering space. The description mentioned two sets of couches, although this was just a piece of static text. But over time, people actually programmed the couches to first exist at all, 
and then to let people sit on them and become increasingly interactive. It became an actual VR couch. You can sit on it, shove people off, stuff things into it, jostle it, reupholster it, search for things, and occasionally fall in. Moo code made it fairly simple to add behaviors like this. From directly in the world, you could type special commands to create actions and code behaviors. Here's an example of code to create a pet rock that you can pet. Uh, verb and program here are just commands, like for movement or taking objects. You'd basically just type this in the game, maybe between chat messages to your friends or moving around. Reprogramming the world was just another fundamental part of existing within it. Moo programs could get surprisingly complex, able to interface with nearly any aspect of the simulation they ran within. And the objects created became more and more elaborate. Advanced programmers were soon creating toys like the helicopter on the West Lawn, which had over 20 custom verbs and included extensive health text. The helicopter's description and behavior changed depending on whether it's running or stopped, parked, hovering, or in flight. If you land on the asphalt roof, they'll hear the rumble of the engine in the living room. There are appropriate messages for spectators outside the helicopter when it takes off, flies overhead, and lands. These messages also differ depending on how high the helicopter is flying. If you're at the landing site when someone crashes, you get to see a team of engineers truck in and put it back together. As you overfly locations, people on the ground are notified. Aircraft cast shadows, which are actual objects that are moved to the various locations the aircraft overflies. This enables people on the ground to wave to people in the helicopter. Type wave at helicopter, for example. Helicopters can only be landed at cataloged outdoor rooms that have wind socks. And this is only a tiny fraction of the, I think, 15,000 word long documentation file for the helicopter object. Um, so object inheritance led to this culture of reuse and sharing these increasingly elaborate toys. The creator of an a useful object could set a fertile flag that would let others create child objects from it. And soon whole catalogs of useful parent objects were available in the house's library. Improved children could themselves be made fertile, leading to long chains of iterative refinements and ever-increasing functionality. The helicopter was a direct descendant of generic aircraft, which itself descended from generic magnetic portable secure seated integrated detail room, in turn a very distant descendant of the basic room object provided originally by Pablo Curtis. The room object, the sort of platonic undescribed ur location from which all others descended, became a popular hangout spot once people realized that it was like any other room object and they could dig exits leading into it. Other kinds of objects could have child classes too. NPCs with complex programming were created. One popular reusable class was a waiter who could politely take drink orders and come back five minutes later with real drinkable objects instantiating everyone's selections. Waiters were installed at popular clubs and hangout spots all over the map. You could also change which object your avatar's inheritance descended from. So there were fertile player classes that had custom behavior for taking automated actions or morphing your appearance on command. People even did weird experiments in character AI. If you logged in without creating an account, you were given a child of a guest class with limited ability to cause trouble. And at some point, someone programmed a whole artificial life ecosystem of reproducing guests from the documentation for those. This is one of a species of creatures that wanders around looking for food. They eat less popular guests and seek to mate with more attractive ones. The guest dispenser is where ancestors of many guests originated. It is still possible to use it. You can alter the way a guest's child will look before it is born. Type interior guest to learn how to do this. And if you do that, here's some of the qualities that you will see when you do. Uh, you can still find um, uh, descendants of these guests wandering Lambda House today, dozens of generations down the chain from their original ancestors. So there's way more to the Lambda Moo story, including one of the earliest experiments with virtual community self-governance. But the point I want to make here is that the past is a freaking gold mine. Lambda Moo is a 30-year-old game, but it's doing so much stuff that in many ways is still far beyond anything that's come since. And these old games can be massive sources of inspiration for our work today. Let's build more programming languages and online spaces and give people the power to reshape their digital realities. Let's make more platforms for weird AI experiments and creative self-expression. Lambda Moo supported like six different flavors of pronouns 30 years ago. It was inventing systems for virtual community governance. The most popular bar was inside the tiny town of a model railroad set you had to shrink down to enter. Let's build this metaverse, damn it. Okay, rant over. <laughs> um, more, more generally, <clears throat> there's so much incredible stuff in the history of this medium. So often, platforms and styles have died before their time, victims of the relentless cycle of technical upgrades. But that means so many good ideas have been left behind without a chance to get really exercised. There's a great quote in the book asking, imagine the challenge for literature if movies had come along within a decade of the invention of the printing press. So strip mine the past. 
If nothing else, I hope reading about these weird old games gives people ideas for new things to try and directions to pursue. Get in the habit of engaging more with the history of our medium. Good novelists don't just read stuff published in the last few years. They reach back into books from the 1900s, the 1800s, the 1700s, and they learn different things from each of those eras. We've got half a century now of interactive narratives to study, and from our mountaintop looking back at the past, there are so many abandoned camps and sites with buried treasure, like play-by-mail games in the lower right, which were digital games that you interacted with by mailing in handwritten orders on printed cards, or Judy Malloy's Uncle Roger in the upper left, which pioneered a concept called narrow bases, wondering what an interactive story might feel like if the interface was a searchable database, not a simulation or a list of choices. We'll explore the future soon enough, whether we want to or not, but let's do a little more sifting through the past before we get there. Number four, text is timeless. It's not retro, it's not antique. It survived longer than any other technology in any other kind of game, and it's fucking awesome. To illustrate this point, I wanna talk about A Mind Forever Voyaging. <clears throat> There's a book out there called A Mind Forever Voyaging, A History of Storytelling in Video Games that to my infinite sadness does not actually talk about A Mind Forever Voyaging. Dylan Holmes, if you're out there, that was stone cold, man. <laughs> but I forgive you. <laughs> so the premise of this game, if you're not familiar with it, is that your whole life has been a lie. You discover you're not a real person. You're an AI who's lived through a simulated childhood and young adulthood to train your virtual brain. And now that you're grown up, your purpose is not to live a normal happy life, but to take part in a simulation of the future. Of course, as we have learned in this talk, you can't predict the future. But that's today. This game is set in the far off year of 2031 and advanced computer models have been developed that can simulate the effects of government policy on future events in an incredibly lifelike virtual world. Just roll with it. The context is that a new presidential administration has come into office with a radical plan to restructure American society. Now this game was being written just after the landslide re-election of Ronald Reagan and the game's president Richard Ryder's policies look pretty similar to the Republican agenda of the 80s. Cutting taxes, cutting social services, harsh prison sentences, an emphasis on patriotism and traditional family values. And this was no accident. Steve Moretzky, the game's author, thought Reagan's policies were awful and were going to have terrible long-term repercussions for the country. So in his game, your AI character has been commissioned to enter a simulation of a future under those policies and decide whether it looks like they're going to be beneficial or harmful. At first, you're looking 10 years into the future and basically your task is to just walk around and observe things. You have the ability to record stuff to use as evidence of the plan's effects, but other than that, you're not given much direction. Just wander around this virtual city and document it. It would be kind of like playing Grand Theft Auto, except instead of a car thief, you're a policy reporter for a government think tank. Please steal that idea too. And uh, some mild spoilers to remind Forever Voyaging in the next 60 seconds. At first, everything looks hunky-dory, much like America did after four years of Reagan in 85. Crime is down, business is booming, and it looks like everything's gonna work out great. But then you get a notification that your observations have opened up the option of simulating further into the future. And the rest of the game is a voyage further and further down a timeline that gets more and more bleak. It's hard to capture the effect of the game's prose in quick excerpts in the middle of a talk like this, but what it really excels at is this kind of world building and aggregate, slowly building up all these glimpses and moments, looking at the human costs of writer's proposed policies. And while the game's social commentary has sometimes been called overly simplistic or naive, as we approach its future, a disturbing number of the game's warnings have come true. It's actually hard to realize now how much of its social commentary was once purely science fiction. The game and its story is kind of shockingly relevant to today. It's, if anything, even more pointed and chilling of a political commentary than it was when first released. And that's not something you can say about most graphical games that came out in 1985. So text is timeless, and while it's a popular move to lean into a retro aesthetic for text-heavy games, I personally think this is increasingly the wrong move. That particular era evoking the golden age of text adventures is now 40 or more years old. I'm much more interested in embracing the fact that text is uniquely a technology that doesn't appreciably age over a human lifetime. It's a part of our civilization, and I really appreciate games that work to make it beautiful and modern as we keep exploring all of these new and different ways of reading it. Let's embrace that stability, that platform of text. A corollary to this is that text is actually quite popular. You might think a book about text games would be pretty niche, and honestly, so did I when I started this project. But at some point, I was just idly wondering if there were any games in the book you could really call popular that had been played by, let's say, half a million or a million people. 
And originally, I was going to walk through all of these one by one, but let's just cut to the end and say, um, actually, you know, there were quite a lot of them. Um, uh, uh, so many games um, that uh, have actually reached a huge audience of people. Um, so yeah, maybe not quite as niche as you might think. I think a lot of us are still trapped in this mentality, conscious or not, that because text was one of the few viable ways to tell an interactive story when we were kids or our parents were gamers, it's inherently outdated and old. It's really not. Don't be embarrassed by it. Embrace it. Own it. Rise to meet its potential. Last lesson. Simple wins, but. We'll get to that but in a minute here. But first, let's talk about a text game called Nested. This is a browser game that went a little bit viral about a decade ago. I love this game because it starts with the simplest possible minimalist distillation of the appeal of text games. It's a word and an invitation to interact with it. So what happens is uh, you expand the single word universe and you see that the universe contains a bunch of galactic superclusters. Uh, inside those are galaxies and inside those are parts of galaxies and stars. And you might explore this sterile universe for a bit and think, well, okay, so what? But then you discover that uh, some of the stars have planets uh, and some of the planets have life on them. And inside the life, you can find eyes and water and blood vessels and uh, in even thoughts. Uh, and the thoughts are different for each kind of life you can find. And that's cool. But then you might find that some of the planets are inhabited by intelligent creatures who have built cities, uh, which contain neighborhoods, which contain houses, which contain people. And inside the people's bodies are body parts and blood and DNA and atoms and protons. And the people also have thoughts and memories too. And if you keep exploring, you can find all kinds of wild stuff from art galleries filled with procedurally generated paintings to websites containing links to other websites to books filled with pages, filled with letters, filled with ink, filled with lipids. And if you drill far enough down into the subatomic particles, you find that each one contains an entire new universe. So Nested was written in JavaScript, which in the early 2010s was still a stable platform. It was still possible to just view source on a website to get a good sense of how it worked. Like many web toys of the time, Nested was coded in a single file full of global variables, inline data, hacked together functions, stuff that would make a quote unquote real coder uh, recoil in horror, but it worked. It was functional, it got the job done. Um, all its code and data could comfortably fit on a five and a quarter inch floppy disk from the 80s. Um, JavaScript at this point was really easy, a really easy platform to sidle up to without much experience, a workbench you could fiddle around and make something fun on. And the code for Nested is very simple. There's some basic plumbing and UI stuff, but the bulk of it is just defining a series of things, each of which might contain other things. Some of the syntax here lets you define a percentage chance or a range of how many of those things might be there. But this is basically it. Ortiel wrote a little debugging tool that would bug him if he mentioned a thing he hadn't yet defined expansions for, so he could just keep fleshing out more things until everything he mentioned in his little universe was defined. The other part of the code was the ability to make tiny text generators. So here's one that just combines an opening consonant cluster with a familiar sounding closing to make a few hundred possible procedural computer brands. Anything could optionally call a generator to define its name. And again, the syntax was so simple that Ortiel just made dozens and dozens of these. Here's some business names for cities. Uh, and here's a slightly more elaborate generator for book titles. I personally would totally read The Simply Stupid Adventures of Richard the Pirate from Space. Sounds great. Um, so I love Nested because it's so clearly a text game. It's creating a simulated, explorable world entirely with language. And yet it's also so simple. By a lot of definitions, it's not a game. You can't win or change the state or control an avatar. All you can do is keep expanding, opening more and more things to see what's inside them. Yet you can spend hours exploring this textual multiverse. It's such a cool example of the joys of procedural text, even divorced from simulations or game mechanics. And it was kind of a viral hit for a while because everyone who played it immediately wanted to stick their friends on it too. So simple can actually be really great. We, or maybe more honestly, I should say I, have a tendency to overcomplicate our systems and our designs because we want to be inventing the future of interactive narrative, right? Which is obviously way more complex and sophisticated than the present or the past. But, and here's this but I mentioned, there's a little more to it than that. And to illustrate this point, I made a graph. We love these. So this is very subjective and unscientific. It's about half of the games from the series, which is not a representative sample of all text games or all games. Um, and the numbers here are totally opinion-based. You could definitely quibble with them. But basically, this is graphing games by narrative system complexity from bottom to top, with games with simpler narrative systems lower on the page. 
and by relative popularity left to right. So not absolute popularity like sales figure, figures, but um, you know uh, what kind of percentage of the audience using computers maybe encountered that game during its lifetime. So uh, on the right are really popular games, on the left are more niche games, or furthest left games that never got a proper release. A big thing you notice here is that there's a bit of a line down and to the right. So very broadly speaking, it's the games with simpler systems that tend to become the most popular and widely played. But I think there's some more complicated takeaways from this chart and some more subtle things going on here. So first of all, if we look at the different clusters along the edges of this kind of complexity popularity wall up here, one of the patterns you see is novelty. Some of the earliest computer games in the 70s were played by everyone because they were the first games and no one had seen anything like them before. Later, you had the first wave of text adventures, which seemed super complex and sophisticated compared to those early games, and again became super popular because they were something fresh and new. And then up here, you've got more recent stuff that's maybe less popular because the computer market share has just grown so large, but still got some notoriety because they were really groundbreaking and doing something no one had ever seen. I think you also see some interesting clustering in the middle, games like Fall in London and 80 Days that are trying to do some new and interesting things technically, but also trying to speak to a more mainstream audience. And there's maybe an interesting sweet spot here in, kind of, in a kind of you know, moderate to fairly big success territory. But it's also interesting to look at movement over time. And what, uh, what you can find several examples of are these interesting sort of arcs that go up into the left and then swing back around. So if you look at Hunt the Wumpus, which sort of evolved into the more complex era of parson interactive fiction, as that fell into semi-obscurity, folks tried increasing the complexity. But as amateur parser IF evolved, it tended to simplify the model, not complicate it. Um, I think it's really interesting that both Galatea and Photopia, which are two of the most famous Parser IF games of all time, are removing core things from uh, interactive fiction experience. Uh, you know, Photopia is removing puzzles and, and uh, challenges. Galatea is removing everything but kind of conversation and character interaction. Um, and you could say that some of those games uh, then helped inspire more successful modern takes on puzzle-less story-driven IF that are continuing to streamline it into forms that reach more people. There's a lot of other shades of this cycle. If you look for it, I don't have time to walk through them all, but I think you can kind of make a front of house, back of house analogy here, or maybe a sales floor and workshop. Towards the right and bottom are your reproducible successes, your big hits, and towards the top and left is the nichier stuff where a lot of the evolution and innovation happens. There's this cycle where interesting hits are taken into the back workshop for a decade or two of work before coming back out into the mainstream again, ideally a little more evolved than before. So I think it's useful if you're creating a narrative game to think about where you want to be in this cycle. Are you gonna start with something popular and take it into the back workshop for a while to evolve it, even though that might risk it not being as popular of a final game? Are you gonna hang out in that workshop area, making cool magic happen for a while? Are you gonna take something back here and try to bring it out into the light and turn it into something that 10 or 100 times as many people will be into? Or maybe you're just gonna stake out a spot somewhere on this map and make a stable platform there where folks can have an anchor to do good work for a while. I think all of these phases are valuable. Okay, that's enough graph. I want to close by talking about one last game from the book, which I think really ties all these points together nicely. It's a little text adventure called The Fire Tower that's one of my personal favorites. It came out of that Parts RIF community by someone who'd been closely involved with it for years. Like Galatea, it was an entry in an IF art show, in this case in the landscape category, where the challenge was to make a game that focused exclusively on a setting, not plot or characters or objects. And so it was very intentionally part of this ongoing conversation and dialogue about what interactive fiction could be. It took advantage of that stable platform of Inform, which was 10 years old at that point, and that it provided an easy way not just to author the game, but a community to release it to, a place to archive it, an ecosystem it could be part of. You can still easily play this game today, which isn't true of all games from 2004. In the game, you take a hike through this beautifully described section of the Appalachian Trail in Tennessee. It's kind of a walking sim, though it came out years before that movement really got started in graphical games. And it's pure exploration. You can examine anything you see, touch it, smell it, move on down the trail whenever you like. It's not stressful. There's no enemies. There's no plot with third act twists. And it's delightful during the pandemic, especially. I've been so in the mood for games like this, and I would love to see more of them. Steal this idea too, please. Uh, the game hasn't really aged at all. The description of the wilderness is just as beautiful as it was in 2004. The prose is lovely and a joy to read. And it's a simple little game that's doing one thing right, and it's beautiful because of that. It doesn't need procedural generation or complex simulation. It's just this beautifully handcrafted little interactive story, and it's just as elaborate as it needs to be. I'm not saying the Fire Tower is the future of interactive storytelling. Like I said at the beginning, we can't predict the future anyway. 
but it's a lovely little piece of its past. And as we kick off this year's Neuroscope, lifting our bright bronze instrument to our eyes and peering eagerly through the lens, I hope you'll all keep in mind that there are more directions to look than straight ahead. I want to mention where you can get the 50 Years of Text Games book if you're interested. You can still pre-order it on Backerkit, and this link will get you to a place you can do that from. And I want to thank the organizers of Neroscope for all their hard work bringing this community event back this year and for inviting me to speak. Thank you. So glad to be here. And let's have a fantastic conference. <laughs>